As we're gradually moving back to opening schools and businesses and, of course, our in-person interactions, I want to remind you, this is all time with cold and flu season getting going. Staying hydrated is key to helping your body deal with the added stress and with the upcoming flu season. My regular fans have heard me talk about a product called Hydrite for a long time now. It's an amazing rapid rehydration drink. It's a mix that, well, we're obsessed with here. I'm excited to announce they've just released Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, just in time for cold and flu season. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of immune-boosting ingredients. Each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract, creates what is hopefully immune-boosting formula that's high in antioxidants and zinc. Combining this with Hydrolyte's seven key electrolytes, it's a fantastic way to stay proactive and properly hydrated. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water and make a great-tasting drink that has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors, and it is gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and it is vegan. And you can find Hydrolyte Plus by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that's H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-W. And be sure to use our code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. It is indeed. Thank you so much. I see everybody uh, piling in. Hi, guys. Uh, a lot of, well, Susan, you'll, be a, you'll love the fact there's a lot of Twitch members flying in mm -hmm. here. We appreciate that. Uh, and Andrew Ashkazvili pointed out, that we should be sure not to get canceled on YouTube, which we will do our damnedest. Uh, and if anybody uh, sees me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, has any concerns, I will happily follow the guidelines on, on YouTube. That's all Dr. I'm saying. Drew the infidel. Volume is low, apparently, Susan. That's oh, you know, saying. it's because of the new mic. Okay. Testing one, two. Are we all I good I turned it now? up. I turned all right, good. Put the mic closer, Marilyn says. All right, <laughs> we have a very special guest today. I want to get right to him. I think you guys will enjoy this conversation. It is Dr. Lawrence Brilliant. He's founder and CEO of Pan Defense Advisory, an American epidemiologist, technologist, philanthropist, author, worked for the WHO in the 70s. Uh, he has engaged with many thought leaders. I mean, every, anyone you can name he has been involved with. has a very famous TED Talk. His book, Sometimes Brilliant, reflects on his life and his extraordinary experiences. Uh, he also was very involved at the World Health Organization with the eradication of smallpox. Let's let's bring Dr. Um, Brilliant in to the conversation. There he is. Thank you, sir, for joining us. <clears throat> Tell us first about the organization. Uh, Susan has a, a thing posted uh, along, between you and me. I don't know if you can see that. It says, we are an inter interdisciplinary network of world-class experts and professionals urgently engaged in pandemic response. That, that sounds way too highfalutin for us. <laughs> we're, we're a bunch of epidemiologists, virologists who got uh, started ask, were asked so many questions by so many different organizations and people uh, after the pandemic began. We figured that we could do better banding together than individually. And uh, in, a, in a funny way, um, the first thing we did, we were called by uh, uh, Steven Soderbergh uh, and... Um, uh, Scott C. Burns and uh, Ian Lipkin, who's my colleague, we, we, we were the people who put together this movie, uh, Contagion. Uh, and uh, Stephen was the director. Ian and I were the scientific advisors. Uh -huh. so the Directors Guild asked us, how can we keep Hollywood safe? And we wrote some protocols that worked to keep Hollywood safe. Um, there's still the protocols being used today. And then we were asked by the Democratic Convention if we could do the same thing for the, that, we did. We wrote protocols and they worked. We offered them to the Republican convention. They didn't use them. What did um, they involve? What are, what are the kind of protocols? Well, you didn't have vaccines yet. Uh, so they really revolve around using testing to keep the virus out of your premises. And in the case of the Directors Guild, uh, some of the productions will test three or as many as five times a week, always using a PCR test. Yeah. Over time, those tests will become less and less expensive, uh, and then they'll be able to be used by schools. And that same cadence could be used by schools, but not at the cost of PCR tests. You know, which which I, I think a lot of, I'm, I'm involved in some productions and some situations that I think are fashioning their policies after what you've got, uh, what you've uh, put in place. But let me, let me ask you, uh, for instance, I've, I've had COVID. I've also had my uh, antibody levels quantified, and I have 
at least six different l very high levels of viral capsid, spike protein, multiple protein antibodies. My spike protein was 150,000 on this one quantitative analysis where the average um, vaccine recipient was about 17,000. So I'm 10 times above a vaccine recipient. They're still testing me every day and still doing stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. What yeah. do we do with that? Well, of course, they're testing you because while you may be immune, we don't yet know that you're not shedding virus. And even if you're vaccinated, we don't yet know whether the vaccine that protects you from getting sick and dying also protects you from spreading the disease. So until those two things happen, yes, you're still going to be tested. And, and by the way, I'm really sorry you got COVID. Oh, no. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted it increased your vocabulary and allowed you to learn more about our acronyms in medicine. That's I'm right. Really That's through. right. It did a lot of stuff to me, but I'm not sure it uh, improved anything. But it, it certainly gave me a perspective um, on treatment. And in fact, uh, you mentioned something before that Mike heated, heated up, and I'm not sure if you were being serious or, or if this is something I'm not aware of, but you mentioned antipsychotics for uh, early COVID. What's going on with that? Oh, no, I'm very serious about it. Uh, you're taking, I understand, fluvoxamine. Correct. You may not want everybody to know that. but Yeah, no, no, but, I, I, I'm, but, I'm wide open. I want to share my experience the, so the, people can the, learn from it. The data me. is very compelling. Uh, that even though, look, we, we've got hundreds of thousands of pharmaceuticals. We use them for different things. Yep. It is very common for docs to do what is called a uh, uh, an off-label prescription because they've noticed in their practice that something that was prescribed for X does even better for Y. Yep, that's where uh, that's where Viagra came from. That's where Viagra came from, and Y is certainly working better. Mm -hmm. That's right, <laughs> but but the but it seems like our profession is sort of fearful of of doing so. It's very weird. They 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 they're waiting for orthodoxy, and they're not willing to improvise or do the things we normally do. I, my thing is like, well, then then we don't need physicians. Just have technicians do it. Or why why are we why are we, why, do, why are we paying doctors to do this if they aren't going to use their judgment? You know, we take an oath in medical school, and it's uh, primo non dolcere, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And if we're true to that oath, it means we only follow science. We only follow what we know. And uh, it, it's not really science we follow. It's known science, unfortunately. We, we may have a very different set of expectations and beliefs, but when we follow science, you're right, it gets pretty, uh, uh, what's the best way to say it? It get pretty. The, the strictures get pretty great. Yeah, it gets constrained. Yeah, and, and and we want to be able to improvise a little bit and use our judgment and do things that we think is the best call for a given case. And and again, you know, human biology is so infinitely complex that we're, you know, to rely on orthodoxy again is a little weird. But uh, which antipsychotics is is it through the sigma one receptor? Is it anti-inflammatory properties, or is there something else going on we don't know about yet from from the antipsychotics? Um, so far, we know that the anti-inflammatory properties are real. We know that the second phase of COVID, which is the inflammation, that the, the, the worst part, yep. um, is real. So obviously, taking any anti-inflammatory uh, has a chance of being good. That's also why the uh, the steroids are good, mm -hmm. dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can use the fluvoxamine, you can use uh, them earlier on when you're still at home before you have to go to the hospital. They're not as, um, it, it's not as big a commitment as right. to take a big slug of dexamethasone. Right, which I did that too. And, and it helped me a lot. I, I could feel the difference. And, and then I took a monoclonal antibody, which kind of stopped things in its tracks. I, could, I literally felt yeah. better during the infusion. And it, I've, I've told people that my infusion nurse reported to me that he hears that all day long to Regeneron and Lily have guessed right, they'll be tremendously affected. However, if the virus, which is mutating and the variants also guess the same antibody, they can clobber it. And unfortunately, we're seeing at least that the, uh, uh, the Brazilian, if not the South African variant are clobbering at least one of those two monoclonals. Which one is the Regeneron? No, Regeneron is not actually a monoclonal. It's, it's two, it's two, right? Yeah. yeah. So it, you know, it's Lily. The Lily one. Uh, I mean, we're beginning to see it. I, I wouldn't want to say that, you know, on any syndicated show that Lily doesn't work. That's not true. But uh, mm. it, it's worth being apprehensive about it. Yeah. It, it seemed harmless. I, you don't want to waste it, though, if it's not going to work against something. It, how do you feel we're going to do against these mutations? Uh, I guess. Well, first of all, it's not harmless. It, it may, in fact, be the monoclonals and the convalescent plasma. 
that is driving the creation of some of these variants. Oh, interesting. You have to, you have to understand, oh, this yeah. variant starts off with no intentionality. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Its only job out of the shop is to replicate. Survive. Yeah, it, it's got to replicate. It's got to yeah. replicate. Yeah. And the moment it hits a wall and it can't replicate, then it looks for ways to avoid the wall. And if the wall is the antiviral or the monoclonal or the vaccine or someone with a previous disease, then the, the first order, their prime directive is to replicate, replicate. And if they can't, then some viruses will spontaneously mutate. Mm -hmm. uh, here, let me, let me put it in a different picture. We've had over 100 million people who are known to have had COVID. Probably we've missed four to one. So call it 500 million, half a billion. Mm -hmm. We're surely going to have a billion mm -hmm. before we're done. Every one of those human beings have billions and billions of viruses in them. Every one of them is replicating. Right. And so that's that's the background radiation, so to speak. And as they replicate, a certain number have mutations. Some of those mutations are clumped together in one virus that becomes a variant. We've had a thousand known variants, a hundred of them. We've figured out their genomics. Of those, about a handful have been declared VOCs, variants of concern. Mm -hmm. WHO has a special group working on uh, VOCs. CDC gave a talk today mm -hmm. on variants of concern. So that, yeah, those are the ones that are going to clobber um, or could clobber our vaccines, our testing, and our treatments. So it what makes this moment particularly perilous. Are, are we going to be able to chase it? I guess Moderna is coming up with a booster vaccine. Is, the, is that the plan? Just keep chasing and spread, you know, trying new vaccine combinations? And the virus is, uh, is replicating at exponential speed, but so is science moving at exponential speed. These mRNA vaccines are phenomenal. I mean, they just, they're breathtaking to have the idea that you can go from a, a virus jumping perhaps from a bat or however it, it did begin uh, to a global vaccination program in less than a year. It took us 200 years to do that with smallpox, yeah. 70 years to do that with polio. Right. And, uh, what I yes, the answer is yes. Moderna will have uh, booster shots. Uh, I, I, sh I should say to everybody, today's vaccines cover today's variants. Let's, let's just right. say that. Uh, it will. And, and then Johnson & Johnson has, what, 60% activity against the South African variant? Is that true? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, 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 yeah that, that is one of the things that we've looked at, but that's in the trial. Right. I don't call that a, a today's vaccine yet because it's not on the market. Got it. But it will be certainly for sure. If you were, this may be an unfair question, but it, let's say you had, were three months down the line, uh, which vaccine would you choose and why? The fastest one that they would give me. Just whoever you get. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. I, I, I'm a little worried about The time value about, of vaccination is huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a little worried about having a reaction. I didn't like having COVID, and I don't want those symptoms to come back. So my plan was, well, you tell me if this is a rational plan, was to watch these huge antibody spikes I've had and see if they start to wane, like get checked every few weeks. And if they wane, that's when I get the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, you put your finger on it right now. It, you may have high antibody titers. You may have high immunity right now, but there's no guarantee that that will last. And if this is like every other relationship between disease and vaccine, the immunity from the vaccine hmm. and the immunity from the disease, no matter how high your titers are now, it's unlikely that they will last as long as a vaccination. But for your health, you're doing the right thing. Right, right. That, that's what I figured. I, and I and who know you know I, I'm assuming they're going to start to drop in about three months. But but back to the um, the bureaucracy of all this. Uh, we have some plans to travel in you know in the late spring, and it, it, they're requiring vaccines <laughs> whether you've had COVID or not at that point. So there you go. We'll, we'll just be getting them. Uh, I, I wanted somebody asked a question a while ago on my uh, stream here about the behavior of the virus during this surge. What, they're asking essentially, why is it falling now? What's the ecology of the virus? And do we really understand that? Uh, are we talking about the United States? The United States. Yeah, let's talk about the United I, States. I think, I think we can answer for the United States. It, it's, it's, is it three or four words? It's Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It, each of those events brought so many people together in an increasingly cold climb. So they want to get together indoors and their holidays and you're eating and you're drinking with your masks off. 
Um, so we've seen three bumpettes that you add three bumpettes and you get a bumpette, you get a bump, a bumper. you get a couple of bumps, you get a spike. <laughs> And this is just the after, this is just the follow on to that. If it goes up, it goes down, right? So the well, question it, really why it goes up, not why it goes yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, it goes down. It goes down because it's no longer being pushed up by these major events. So I don't know that there'll be a Super Bowl bump at, but other than that, between now and uh, Memorial Day, we're in a pretty bump less world, and I suspect the case count will go down. You may notice the death count has not gone down. It continues sort of plateau, plateaued. Yeah, it is plateaued, and and uh, we will certainly exceed the six hundred thousand deaths that we had in nineteen eighteen. Why is that? Why, why will we exceed that? No, why is it not going it's, down? It's a at least a two week lagging indicator, at least, right, Doctor William? It, it is. It's yeah. a lagging indicator. You, you figure it's about two weeks that hospitalizations lag cases, another two weeks for ICU admissions, mm -hmm. and then another two or three weeks, unfortunately, before deaths lag. So it's like six weeks then by the time the deaths really start to drop. Um, the hospitalization rate has certainly come down nicely, which has been sort of the big concern in this, in this uh, whole outbreak we've been through lately. Um, it is, it, you know, it's interesting. My, our son was driving across country and he was saying, you know, it doesn't matter what state you're in, what the mandate is. People seem to have adjusted their behavior across the country. In other words, people are not going indoors. They're wearing their masks. So it really isn't, it didn't, in many states, didn't require a uh, any kind of government mandate in order to for people to adjust their behavior, and and I've read that before in certain pandemic literature that people naturally start to pull back from social interaction when they get scared. Well, you tell your your son that he's just uh, provided an answer that took us about three months of research. Uh, my son and I were co-authors of a paper that was published in Lancet last week, mm. saying that it's the uh, behavior, not the mandate. Right. It's the wearing of the face masks and the mandates don't seem to have much effect on that number. Interesting. And, and I know here in California, we're, we're, we're declining rather rapidly in the face of opening up a bit. And so the opening up isn't changing our behavior so much, uh, at least not in ways that people are increasing their risk taking. It doesn't seem anyway. We'll see, I guess. We're, I, I would be worried we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, the uh, we're not, we don't have this huge push that has come from the holidays. We may have, again, from the Super Bowl. We don't have that huge push. So it may be mistaken identity that we think the drop is okay and that our behavior right now is not affecting it. Uh, look, we haven't dropped that far. We've dropped from an artificially high point, but we're still higher than we were in April. Yeah, that's true. I, I, was, I was looking at exactly that. Let's hear the national. Are you talking about nationally or California? Both. I mean, both. Yeah. What, Here's California. I'm just looking at uh, COVID tracking project. Don't, and COVID tracking project is very good. Yeah. They, they say uh, some uh, friends of ours have said they're going to discontinue it in March. Have you heard this? Uh, th that's overly ambitious. If their goal is to keep tracking COVID, there'll still be COVID to track. No, I know. They, they, but I think they're, uh, they've run out of funds or something. I said they're, I don't know what the issue is, but they're, they put a stop date. Well, like, say that over and over again, and people will find the funds. There's good. A lot right, of that's need good. Available. So we were at 15,000 cases uh, yesterday, uh, and April, the, the spike in July only went to, what, eight 9,000. So there you go. Um, somebody was just asking also in the stream what to do if you want the vaccine, but you have previous anaphylactoid reactions to uh, vaccine. Yeah, so the, every place you go to get a vaccine, there should be a, a nurse or a trained health professional where they give you the vaccination. Mm -hmm. And you'll be asked to stay for 30 minutes, whereas most people are asked to stay only for 15 minutes uh, because the anaphylactoid-like response takes place pretty quickly. So don't, don't leave before you've gone that full 30 minutes. Right, uh, but you, you would not avoid the vaccine if you had that history. No, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I've had some allergies that were pretty serious and yeah. drug reactions, so I, I'm, I did it anyway. SSRI, kind of a novel SSRI. Well, I mean, and I think, I think they've been working with Thorazine and seeing some early responses. Oh, interesting. And, and, and once again, is it the Sigma-1 receptor that we think the Luvoxa, uh, fluvoxamine is using? Or is there other, uh, I other, other mechanisms? I think it's the, I think it's the anti-inflammatory reaction that we don't understand. <laughs> Not fully understood, yeah. How about schools? Where, where do you uh, come in on what we should be doing there? Yeah, I think schools is a really becomes an economic elitism question because 
uh, we can make all schools safe. We know how to do it. Uh, it's just expensive as hell. And we don't have enough money for public schools before there was a pandemic. And we don't want to say, well, you can open a school if you can pay for it and further increase the schism. Um, I think that the answer will be that when these, not, not antigen tests per se, but when these rapid tests, and I don't want to say antigen because the antigen tests have been really disappointing. Hmm. Uh, there's 150 of them that have been approved. Most of them are usually about 50% uh, accurate, which means you can flip a coin. There's some that are better than that. I, I admit some of them are quite good. But until you can get a $5 or $10, five minute or 10 minute at home sputum test, self-administered, that's highly accurate, then you can't do what we want to do. That's when we'll get normal schools back online. We'll get normal uh, musical festivals and restaurants. We're not that far away from it. Um, I'd estimate that we have those in the summer, uh, certainly by the fall. I expect that even without putting a, a national program together, we'll have schools having normal semesters by September. We'll have some schools able to afford it earlier. Uh, and if the state puts money up or the feds put money up, we will have more schools able to do it earlier. And, and, and the idea being screening three times a week kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for me right now, I think of the vaccines as being icing on the cake to any decision about opening. Uh, they, they're really more important than opening in a way, but they're not directly related because you don't, you don't get the effect of a vaccine in time to open a school or, or anything else. Susan, I hear you talking back there. Did... I'm blocking somebody on. Ah, okay. <laughs> good, good times. You were start, You were actually talking to them as you did so. No, I just. <laughs> <laughs> um, I asked you a question before the mics heated up that I, I'm now going to ask. Uh, have we have we learned something in the course of this pandemic? Do we, do we walk away? It, it, you know, both positive and negative. Uh, you know, learning has many different kind of qualities. Um, I feel like I learned a lot and, and I've sort of uh, walked away with some things I don't fully understand. I haven't really learned yet, but I have some more questions as a result. What do you say? Well, we've learned some, I'll say smaller things and, and then one really big thing. Um, we've learned that epidemiologists who were thought of as Cassandras were right. We've learned that pandemics are real. We've learned that we have to understand one of the effects of modernity is to put human beings and animals into each other's territory, and then we exchange viruses. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've learned that two or three or four of these events of spillover of viruses jumping from animals to humans occur every year. So we, need, we have to understand this is not the last pandemic that we'll have. Uh, we've learned that science moves at the speed of a pandemic and is just breathtaking in some ways. Um, and we've learned that a pandemic is extraordinarily political uh, and the denial of pandemics and face masks uh, really breaks down around party lines much more than it breaks down around anything else. So those are the small things. Um, and, and individuals like yourself have learned, um, you got a postgraduate course in epidemiology. Welcome. I know, that. it's crazy. But, uh, but there's one thing even bigger that we've learned. So after the Second World War, when we we, we as a, as a human population, we looked over the abyss and we looked into the, the gates of hell, I think. And we saw the, the skeletons coming out of the concentration camps in Auschwitz. We saw the firebombing of Dresden, the mushroom clouds over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We all knew something had gone terribly wrong. I don't even think there was a meeting, but people looked at it and said, look, I'm willing to negotiate a little bit of my own personal sovereignty. I'm willing to barter a little of my nation's unalloyed power. And we created all these organizations, this alphabet soup of WHO and FAO and the United Nations Security Council, <coughs> Bretton Woods, the World Bank, you can go on and on. And with that, we've had 70 years of peace, relative peace. Now, and, and those were, I would call those really uh, centripetal forces, the countries coming together. Now we're in an area, era of nationalism. Mm. Good, bad, or indifferent, nationalism creates centrifugal forces in the world. And Albert Einstein once said that you cannot solve a problem at the same level at which it was created. And the problem that we have right now, this pandemic, it cannot be solved 
other than at a global level. And we, what we've learned is that those institutions we created 70 years ago, they're long in the tooth. Nationalism is harming their ability to function. Look at the underfunding of WHO and, uh, and the US threatening to leave WHO. We need those organizations to solve a pandemic. We probably need them to solve other global threats, nuclear weapons, climate change. So I think we learn we're not ready to solve those problems. And nationalism has got to be evaluated and everybody's got to make their own choice, but it's got to be evaluated in the externalities, in the knock-on effects that it creates. This is one of them. And, and one of the main, we're really taking issue with pandemic preparedness, right? Pandemic response and pandemic preparedness. That's right. Yeah. I, I think the pandemic preparedness goes very deep into the, our culture. Uh, uh, last year, uh, humans consumed 2 billion wild animals from exotic markets and uh, billions of kilograms of bush meat. Uh, uh, the more you eat an animal with them living in the wild, uh, the more likely you are to encounter a, a potential pandemic virus. But likewise, the way that animal husbandry takes place in some parts of Southeast Asia, where you have houses that the bottom floor is where the cattle are, uh, or the pigs, the next floor is where the chickens are and the top floor is where humans are. And when you eat the pigs, what's left over, you cut it up, it's called rendering and you feed it to the chickens. When you eat the chickens, you cut them up and you feed them to the pigs. Humans, pigs and, and chickens eating the same stuff is not a good formula for staying safe from pandemics. Interesting. Back to the political craziness that has evolved, there was a, some of the, at least primordially, some of the same stuff going on in 1918, was there not? Yes. So so this is not, our behavior now is almost, I don't want to say predictable, but it seems to be commonplace in pandemics. Yeah, what else was happening in 1918 was a, a variant, a mutation, a mm. second wave that uh, was much worse than the first wave. So we, we may think we've had three wave acts or bump ets, I'm not sure that we've had our second wave yet. So this may have just all been one wave. Yeah, when you when you look at the, the graphs and you get far enough away, it all looks like one, one, one wave. Do, do you think we're going to, if assuming this is all one wave, do you think a second wave is, a second wave would, would have to be in the face of a mutation that gets around the vaccine, right? Yes. Yeah, and and that's a risk factor, but not a foregone conclusion. No, no, it's certainly not a foregone yeah. conclusion. You know yeah. what it is? It's a race. Yeah. Race between the viral viruses, particularly the mutants and the vaccines and our ingenuity. Back to, to what we've learned. It, it, I, I'm a little surprised. Well, I, I want to go to therapeutics a little bit. Uh, I, I'm surprised at how uh, ossified so many physicians have been in there, or, or at least um, waiting for orthodoxy to, to treat patients when there was, there's lots of good literature out there sort of suggesting a direction. Have you noticed that? Yes. What, what is that it, something? It was not that way when I was in training. We were not, I was not trained that way. Let's put it that way. I was trained to use my judgment uh, and, and improvise. And it, it I'm wondering if it is the, fu the a function of so many physicians now working for large corporations or large medical groups or, or, or large hospitals where they're afraid to step out of clinical pathways. I, I, I'm sure that that's part of it, the e enormous complexity of medicine, the super specialization and not wanting to cross over into a specialty you don't know. But, but I think it is what we talked about earlier. We, you and I both took an oath Primo non docere, or no carry as it's called now. Yeah. First, do no harm. And there's a fear of doing harm with something that you don't have experience with. Right. And, and I think it's been, it's just harder to make a mistake these days in, in any of any other professions. Um, there are people here asking, wanting to ask you questions on my thread. Let me see what they're saying here. Uh this is Joe. Joe, uh, you're saying, can we take questions about what uh, Dr. Brilliant said? I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, uh, all right. I'm not quite sure where they're all going with this. It's, all, it's all, always hard to follow threads. Uh, 
Are there are there other topics that are uh, keeping you up at night these days? Well, there's so many. I mean, I'm worried. About... <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> pick you know, pick you know, one. There, there are so many keeping me up at night that my daughter has made me pledge no doom at the dinner table. Oh. Mm. You know, epidemiologists, we're, we're sort of, we're either attracted to this stuff or because we're in it, we feel it. Um, you know, I worry uh, in the United States, um, I love this country. And uh, you and I talked about our, our ancestors. We, we, we have benefited from this country. I know my family has dr dramatically. My grandfather, when he came over, it was right around 1918. Uh, I lost one set of grandparents to the, to the flu, but I didn't lose any grandparents to anything inside the United States. They, they all did very well, and I was very lucky because of that. So I do worry a lot about uh, the divisiveness. I worry that um, you probably don't know this. It's not on my bio with you, but but I started something called The Well. Hmm. It was one of the first uh, social media networks. I started it in 1985. Uh, and um, Steve Jobs was a dear friend. We had been in India. He helped fund it. Hmm. And it was, it was like super bulletin board, but it was the progenitor of a lot of the social networks. So I, I have real mixed feelings about the beginning of the internet and social media. When it was young, it was aspirational. It was great. We mm -hmm. thought we'd bring the other people and share ideas. But the balkanization of the internet, the way that we all drink from our own unique fire hoses, and we don't drink from each other's fire hoses. Um, that really bothers me. Uh, yeah, that, that famous uh, quote of Kellyanne Conway, a different, that comment really bothers me. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, and that's, uh, I don't know what we do about that. I, I keep wondering if it's the fault of our education system that people aren't really taught to crit critically think. I don't know. Um, I'm looking at, again, some of the questions here. Someone uh, asking about reinfection with COVID. Uh, I know some. I know a couple of cases where there was clear reinfection. Um, I swear I, I've told people I will jump off a building if I'm reinfected. Because <laughs> it was a pretty brutal experience. Um, do we know anything about people that are reinfected? Is it, is it, uh, do we think this is likely variants, or do we just think the immunity is waning in certain people, or were they initially milder that didn't have a robust immune response, or all of the above? All the above. Yeah. All the, I think uh, two months ago, if you were a physician and you had a, a genuine reinfection, you'd get an article in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. It was so rare. Yeah, um, that's now right. Now we're finding more and more in the aphorism, the only reason you didn't find it before is you didn't look. So there's some amount of reinfection. It's not a big uh, part of the, the problem we have with COVID. It's, it's still really rare. However, the variants definitely don't care. And in some instances, some of the variants don't care that you had a wild COVID before. Right. We should remember that what we call wild COVID today is actually itself a variant. If you remember the virus that emerged in Wuhan, that was the original Wuhan type of COVID. Then it went to Italy and it did a huge reassortment and it came out as the G variant hmm. and it spread faster as we're finding. Mm -hmm. uh, the characteristic of all the variants is that they spread faster, they infect more, mm. they're more transmissible. Indeed, that is the major reason why a mutation is selected. It is selected by evolution because it allows the virus to spread faster and be more transmissible. So some of these variants are definitely uh, clobbering, clobbering immunity from um, the wild form of COVID. Uh, we have estimates of up to 50 or 60% reinfection in South Africa. Oh, really? From the variants. Ugh, that sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, maybe we'll give you much good news. Are, are they, are <laughs> they? Oh, Super Bowl was great. I, it was <laughs> I don't really know, even that was a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't worry, we've been there. Yeah. Uh, all right, I feel like we've, oh, uh, I guess the, the other the other things I want to get into um, would be therapeutics. Do you have any any specific feelings about specific therapeutics? We talked a little bit about monoclonal antibodies. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that the a kind of you know sometimes you get a trivalent uh, vaccine instead of a quadrivalent vaccine. I'd like to see more trivalent and quadrivalent therapeutics. Mm. 
Um, and a, 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 a natural multivalent therapeutic is convalescent plasma mm -hmm. because you're gonna have lots of different anti antibodies. Um, but convalescent plasma comes from one person. You wanna get pooled convalescent plasma. Mm -hmm. Pooled convalescent plasma still has an uncertain amount of uh, therapeutic capability. I'd like to see highly um, uh, efficacious uh, pooled plasma, and I'd like to see that become the source of some kind of a polyclonal um, antibody treatment. That makes That's sense. the way we can evade and get ahead of and get smarter than the virus. Well, and I, I'm assuming when you say trivalent or quadrivalent therapeutics, you're talking about hitting the virus from multiple places like we do with HIV. Yeah, different, different, fit, yeah. exactly different, yeah. but specifically different parts of the spike, of the capsule, of the nucleus. Because but, but, those are places that are unlikely to mutate as fast as the spike is. But 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 I guess I'm asking, are, are in addition to polyvalent, you know, pooled, pooled antibodies, are we also just thinking philosophically about approach to the virus that we should be hitting it much like we use combination antibiotics, we use combination antivirals yeah. for HIV. Are you suggesting that that be sort of the philosophy of, of uh, treatment? No, that's one of the philosophies. That's the big pharma philosophy. But as you said, repurposing other um, uh, other um, therapeutics, yep. repurposing other natural um, treatments, that's got to be a big part of it. And UCSF here in San Francisco has a huge program looking at something like 10,000 different therapeutics wow. and trying them all either as a Gedunkin experiment, just mm -hmm. thinking about it, or in real life to see which ones can be repurposed. And they're you know, without limits. It doesn't matter what it was being used for before. They're, they're trying to figure out if it will work for this. And in fact, I think um, more recently, the, uh, the uh, very promising experiments with colchicine, a drug that's used really for gout, yeah. uh, appears to have some efficacious uh, response. And I think you still need to go through the usual drug therapeutic efficacy test, yeah. but it's great to get that into into. Yeah, I, 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 uh, when I, when I was uh, at a decision point in my therapeutics, which was about a week ago, where I was feeling like I needed to do something, that's what my physician and I discussed, whether do we try colchicine, do we try loranlimab, do we try anti-cytokine things, or do we try fluvoxamine? And I thought, you know, I just, I just thought fluvoxamine, it, it feels so neurological what I'm getting through, and I feel like if I had therapeutic success, I could then share that for other people, you know? It's such an easy one to access, and and my and if I have therapeutic success, I could a model that, but b you know people could then go to their doctor, and it's such an easy layup of medication to prescribe. Well, as a doctor who's a communicator, a great communicator, you you should write about your experience. It would be really helpful to a lot of people. You, you, people have been, I did write about it, and and I have found that I have much more impact doing like little um, well things like this, discussing it in, in these streams. Also, uh, Instagram lives, strangely, <laughs> Instagram lives of people like hearing about these stories because they're sort of in real time. You know, as you're you know getting well or getting sick or whatever it is, there you are talking to the world about it. And it sort of has a, has a narrative that uh, reaches people, I think. Yeah, but yes, thank you. I think that's right. Years with uh, Seth MacFarlane, which had a lot of uh, impact. It was really fun. What, what'd you do with Seth? Oh my God, is he a genius? What, what, uh, what'd you do with him? We did an Instagram live. Oh, no kidding. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. But, but you know what, what I recommend, that's why don't you write an article for um, a medical journal about your experience as a doctor? Right. I think that would be picked up by the media. Okay. All right, I might do something even, like that. Just even just a letter. Yeah, that's a good idea. Like a, a letter to any jam or something. Or jam Will you be our PR person? We we're, <laughs> we need a new one. <laughs> no, wait, wait. you're doing pretty good with PR. <laughs> uh, Chris Jensen, very funny. I'm still coughing, but my OCD is gone. But, you know, you know, I I am not aware of any psych uh, you know psychotherapeutic. I've I've not experienced anything from uh, Luvox that I could put my finger on, except. Um, that the ringing in my ears is better and it comes back after about six hours. So as, as the medicine wears off, I'm, I'm aware of more neurological symptoms. And it has corrected or helped this goofy sinking feeling. It, it's, it's associated with fatigue, but it, I can only describe it as it's, it's an uncanny feeling. It feels like a sinking quality. And I, I'm sure there's something neurological about it. Has to be. 
Weird. It's a lousy uh, disease. Yeah, really it, disease. yeah, I agree. It's uh, it's it's not fun. Uh, all mm. right, Susan, do you have any questions for Dr. Brilliant? I heard you. Did do. you see the question from Christopher Long Longgren? It was kind of long. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can scroll up. It. Here it is. Has your wonderful guest seen anything on this report? Pedulated interferon uh, and lambda. The, okay, the, wait. There is there's a big study <laughs> out for uh, interferon. Go, I'll let you address that. I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so this has been, you know, I wouldn't say controversial. This has been interesting to a lot of people, <clears throat> enough so that WHO decided to include interferon in one of their very, very large multi-country, multi-center tests. And uh, the jury is still out, but it is being looked at. I mean, the first, the first uh, of these, they call Harmony uh, studies, the first of the Harmony <laughs> studies uh, is finished and the results published, but interferon is in the second one. I, I'm not surprised that, that would have some benefit. It is, this all feels like a, a out of whack immune function, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not sure that we'll ever get to the point where it's a pinpointed sort of uh, explanation of what's going on. I don't know. Well, uh, well, let me say, can I say one thing about yeah. that? Yeah. I think we made a very big mistake at the beginning by calling it a respiratory disease and by uh, Interesting. focusing the comparison onto influenza. Yeah, which for sure really, I did. It's really a disease of the lungs. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely made a huge error by by comparing it to, well, I was comparing it to H1N1 uh, yeah. because I had that also. And that was a very different illness. And at my, my point at the time was, hey, everybody, don't panic. We had a we had a pandemic in 2009. You didn't even know it. I, I knew it because I got it. And I saw a lot of he it. He always gets it. Yeah, but... Um, <laughs> But that was that was a false equivalency. That was not that was a fallacy. It, it, it is a false equivalency. Yeah. But even beyond that, the idea of focusing on the respiratory characteristics yeah. of COVID, it, it is spread as a respiratory disease. That's correct. Yeah. But it affects every single system. And in that, it is less like influenza and more like smallpox. Oh, interesting. Smallpox was a respiratory disease. Interesting. It affected every single system. And like COVID, which appears to create micro infarcts at the small vessel level and create vasculitis. Well, smallpox did something like that. Uh. You had hemorrhagic smallpox that was really clearly a, 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 a blood disyncrasy or something of that nature. So we would be better off thinking of COVID as we think about smallpox than as we think about respiratory diseases like influenza. I don't mean to compare it. Smallpox killed one out of three people. COVID doesn't do that. Um, but there's a lot of things about COVID that smallpox didn't do. Yeah. And, and I've never seen a case of, of smallpox, but but I keep hearing, you know, I hear in the literature, people will occasionally or casually say, well, smallpox today would not have killed one in three because we have such good supportive care, blah, 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 blah. And uh, what I'm hearing you say is that's not necessarily true. If this is, an, if this is a vasculitis, and polyinflammatory disease, who knows? Somebody sent me a proposal recently. I'm a part of the Skoll Foundation community, and they asked me to take a look at it. And it was a homeopathic uh, uh, product. And they said that when it was used historically, it reduced the death rate from smallpox from one third to 5%. Hmm. So I threw the paper out because hmm. that's not possible. That's not possible for homeopathic treatment or an allopathic treatment. Um, we, we tried everything we had at that time to do something about smallpox, but still it was one out of three. Mm -hmm. And I've seen thousands of cases of smallpox. I've had thousands of children die in my arms from smallpox. Mm -hmm. We had no treatment possible. Yes, I think palliative care, hospital care would probably knock the death rate down just as it has in Ebola. Mm -hmm. You know, Ebola had a when you and I went to medical school, it was 100% fatal. Mm -hmm. But in good care, in American hospital quality, you can probably get that down to 50% or even lower. I think the same thing would happen with smallpox. Mm -hmm. But it, it it wouldn't get down all that much. It's a really terrible disease. Here's a question for you. Have you heard about the criticism of selective endpoints in the recent CDC mask study? What do you think about that criticism? I'm not quite sure what they're referring to. Do you know what that is? Selective endpoints? Are they looking at the... Uh, trying to figure out what is the effectiveness of wearing a mask. I think that's what they're looking at. And the yeah. endpoints that they're looking at are community decrease in incidence. Mm -hmm. If that's correct, I think it's right. I mean, it's, it's very difficult 
to figure out what is the impact on a disease of something that's done at the individual level and extrapolated to the population level. The article that I mentioned before that we published in Lancet last week tried to fix that by looking at 300,000 people who were surveyed by SurveyMonkey for mm -hmm. another reason and then tag on some questions to the end of that survey. We were able to, uh, to, to figure out that about 75 or 80 percent of Americans are wearing face masks mm -hmm. when they go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. when they go out to places like that. Um, the only thing we found that separated it, who wore a mask and who didn't was politics. It wasn't age or demographics. It wasn't city. It wasn't state. And it wasn't, as I said earlier, it wasn't mandates. It was just if you're a Democrat, you know, you're likely to wear a face mask. If you're a Republican, you're likely not to wear a face mask. Uh, and that seems, um, it's not a survival tactic that I would recommend. <laughs> but, but I would also say I wish the public health world would step up and try to think of ways of exposing people to messaging that could soften that. You, we've you always know, been terrible. What's that? We've been terrible. Public, we, we in public health have been awful at communications. Do you remember your first public health message when you were a child and it was sex education? Yeah. And it, it was a, it was one seat of paper but, and it said, these are the things you should not do and no, everything you wanted to do. I, I know, but, but I was very involved in, during HIV in the public health messaging. And by the end of a decade, we'd figured out how to do it. It was relatable source, you know, another young person or a gay, yep. or whatever it yep. is, relatable yep. source, yep. a narrative yep. and, and humor. Those were the three elements that that got to change people's behavior. It's why I got involved with a show called uh, Sixteen and Pregnant, and I thought, oh, that's going to change pregnancy. I know, I know that will get through to these kids. That the narratives and the stories that they they'll get it. Kids aren't dumb; they're just resistant to the information. Once they see a relatable source going through the stress of child rearing, oh, okay, I get it. And that's exactly what happened. Can, can I can I can I take that as you're volunteering to help us with PR for COVID? Yeah, I yeah, I've got some guys. I've seen I've seen some really good health messaging from these two guys. They're improvisational actors. What's the name? Chad uh, and Chad goes deep. Chad goes and they deep. they play sort of surfer dudes. And they they with they did this great video in Huntington Beach, which is a very resistant population. And he walked around there, hey, free mask, free mask. And they'd, yeah. be, they'd, and they'd be getting attacked aggressively. And these they just behave like surfer do. They go, well, is this thing called coronavirus? And they, like, their, their confusion stood out in bold relief against the crazy aggression of people refusing. to. And it got the point home. It, got, it just drove it home. I'll, I'll send you the video. Yeah. And that kind of thing is the stuff that should be all over the place. I also think we should be educating people about how to use the healthcare system. Right. Don't go to the yeah. ER, mm -hmm. use telemedicine, understand yeah. what will keep you out of the hospital. Here are the yeah. vitamins. Let, let's talk about some of the natural things. You mentioned some natural therapeutics or even prophylactics. What, what, what can people do there? Let's do that educational message. Can right you now. answer Jeff Gulko's question about nose sprays? No, uh, not right now. Okay. Not right now. But go ahead. The natural products. You mentioned some natural products. Ask, ask me the ones that, that you you you're interested in. All right, so we'll we'll do the, the usual ones. Uh, zinc. Yeah, I think uh, there's a role for zinc, and it's uh, both both in terms of possibly boosting immune function, also maybe even once you get the illness, the zinc may have some benefit. Yes. I, I'm going to answer this about both zinc and vitamin D. The okay. other one's probably number two on your list. Yep. If you are um, deficient in vitamin D, you should, I believe, take vitamin D and eliminate that deficiency. We've seen that people who have COVID and have a serious COVID are at that time zinc deficiency. We don't, we don't really know whether they've become deficient because of the disease right. or they got the disease because of the deficiency, but it sure wouldn't hurt. Right. Bring your and and, and I can level. tell you as someone that works with uh, aging populations quite a bit, it's, it's hard to get people's vitamin D levels up into the so-called normal range. 35 is sort of the number we... I, I can't tell you how many people on large amounts of vitamin D are 37, 36. It's very common, very common. So that to me feels like, well, why not? Let's do vitamin D. Zinc, I, I worry about copper metabolism. Who, how long are people going to stay on zinc? I, I wonder about that, right? Um, and then vitamin C? I've never seen it work. I've always wanted it to work. Linus <laughs> won two Nobel Prizes. How yeah. could he not right? Right, <laughs> right. 
Uh, no, no harm, no foul, though. To be fair, um, no harm. Yeah. Uh, let me. Uh, quir- a lot quir- of What's that? You have what? Eat a lot of oranges anyway. Yeah. Right. Uh, quercetin. I have no experience with it. Okay. So somebody uh, it, it touted it to me as not just a ionophore for the zinc, but also reduces this. It's another theory about the inflammatory phase of this illness that it's a mast cell mediated degranulation. Have you have you heard that theory? No, I have, I have no no experience with it. Yeah, and, and that quercetin somehow stabilizes that. Oh, somebody's saying I hear it's good for asthma quercetin. Same same theory applies there. Uh, what am I missing? I feel like I'm missing a couple other things that are out. Oh, what about well, glu- you're, you're, you're melatonin. Missing melatonin, glutathione, any of these antioxidants? Yeah. yeah. What do you say about and, that? And uh, and pepsid. Pepsid, you know, right? Pepsid. Pepsid has been used for a very long time for people who are in ICU, so it's difficult to do science and distinguish whether it's because you're getting out of the ICU and <laughs> it's hard to really tell. Right. But it can't hurt. I, when I again, when I was we're doing a lot of ICU medicine, we had people on Pepsi because they kept getting GI bleeds, exactly. uh, and so we just kept them on it all. You know, sucralfate Pepsi was sort of routine in ICU patient. Uh, have you heard about this new uh, antiviral in Israel? I'm sure you've been asked about that. Is that I have. Yeah. Is, is that for real? Yeah. Do we think something's yeah. happening there? Well, the the numbers are not. There's no placebo control in yeah. the numbers that they announce. But the numbers that they announce are pretty startling and yeah. good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, this is a pandemic. We're going to have over half a million people dead within two months. Yeah. People who get this disease should be free to try whatever they can right. get access to. Doctors should be free to try. This is not a normal time. Right. Um, it, yeah. It's interesting to me that back we were talking earlier about the ossification and the orthodoxy. It's uh, every time I speak to a surgeon about some of these ideas, they jump at it. They use it for their patients and their family and themselves. Mm-hmm. Every time I talk to an internist, they go, "No, no, no, no. We don't know. We we don't we don't have the data yet." And I, I don't know. I, uh, that really that troubles me. You think it's something about uh, surgeons are either win or lose pretty quickly? Well, uh, surgeons are used to, right. Surgeons are, so look, if a surgeon gets into trouble in a surgical field, they must improvise. They must, they must figure out something to do in that moment. And I think they're used to thinking that way. It's like, we, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I, I have my judgment, I have my skill set, and I'm going to try to do the best I can for the patient. And I, I don't know, our, our, the medicine side has sort of, Something has changed. I don't know if it's the prescribe again. I don't know if it's the training or if it's the the siloing of all the different disciplines or or the the corporatization of everything or the or the legalities the, the or the politics. People may be seen fear of being canceled for trying something that uh, you know that they somebody else was talking about on the View. Yep. Yep. So. No, you're right. I think you're right. So. Well, listen, Dr. Brilliant, uh, is there anything, I, did I leave anything out? I think we did a pretty interesting survey of, of stuff. I, everything on my list we covered. Um, I, have one. Book. I want to have them on Instagram Live, though. Okay, we'll do an Instagram Live. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I have a question for you. You worked with Soderberg on Contagion. Did you see the Nick that he did? Uh, no, I haven't seen it, but I know about it. <laughs> oh, boy. You, you, you owe it to yourself. <laughs> you, you owe it to yourself. It's, he did such an yeah. amazing job on that. It was unbelievable. Well, he, 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 you know, because it, it, I worked with him on the set, he, um, he, he's the filmmaker. He's the cameraman. Yep. He edits in the camera. Crazy. Every night, he ships out the rushes. They're, they're near finished product. He does four jobs at one time, and each of them better than almost anybody else. Wow. You got to watch him on, on the Oscars. Uh, Soderberg and uh, Stacy Shear are doing the Oscars, both friends from Contagion. So I think the Oscars is going to have a lot of jokes on about Contagion on it. Oh, interesting. So, so he's producing it this year. They're not producing it. They are the, uh, the they are the talking heads. Oh, fascinating. That'll be really interesting. They it's... might actually be doing some of the producing too. Yeah, I, I can't imagine letting him letting go of too much of that stuff. So, well, <laughs> the, the way I am now, person. yeah, the, I have to go lie down after I've talked for about an hour. <laughs> That's literally what happens. I have to just go lie down. It's very Aww. strange. It's it's a very weird feeling. But um, but then I'm okay again for a while. So you know, at least I'm grateful for that. You know uh, that uh, uh, of all the people working on uh, Contagion, two got COVID. Mm. 
which was quite an irony since people say that contagion was prescient. Unfortunately, uh, we had uh, one of the writers and one of the other scientists get COVID. It's not a fun disease. Mm -mm. No, not if, not if you get not if you're older. If you're young, it's not that big a Our deal. Our son had it. And it yeah, was son like had he walked right through it. No yeah, big deal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you're older and you get moderate or more, that's it's a nasty experience. It, it is. But I did want to ask you one question, which is please how how high would that building be? Enough to do the job. <laughs> so so because I I wouldn't want to maybe the bridge out here. We got a, a bridge that's pretty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it just it just the I, I I don't think I'm I'm not planning and I'm not serious about it if we're asking if my SI is for real. Um but but I just the idea of it is so overwhelming. It was just such a relentless brutal thing. Um so there you go. Uh it, again, anything else I left out, Dr. Brilliant? Did, did I I gave the name of your book, I believe. Um Sometimes Brilliant. Sometimes Brilliant. That's easy. Because uh, it's sometimes not so. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we will do maybe an Instagram live at some point. I don't want to be left out by Seth McFarland. I know. Now you're in trouble. I, when, you, when you mentioned Seth, I thought you were going to say that he had you do uh, an episode of his, what's it called? The Wilbur? His, uh, no, it's, it's, but you're close. The Orville. The Orville. <laughs> the Orville. Well, I'm, I'm working with him, uh, and he's probably got the safest set in Hollywood. He's, he's such a great guy, and he's so diligent and thoughtful. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, I've known him for a long, time. You got long... to sing with him yeah, on stage. Yeah, I got to sing with him on stage. What, what a lot of people don't know is not only does he write every episode, he's in there like erasing, you know, the cartoons, you know, wants everything a certain way. He's in on, he used to be anyway, on every voiceover, the recording, does the music, he's sings brilliant. the songs. It, it's, it's just such a he's amazing tour de force. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, several of the voices is him, you know, so... All right. Well, crazy. Uh, Dr. Brilliant, the pandefense.com is the website. I, I'm referring everyone there. Uh, do you Just want people? Just pandefense.com, not the pandefense. You, okay. Pandefense.com. Do you want me to refer people to Twitter or Facebook, anywhere else we can find you? Uh, Twitter would be fine. At Larry Brilliant. At I, Larry try, Brilliant. I try to take the stuff about the pandemic that's really important and make, make it out into English. I am going to follow you right now. I, I couldn't find it. What It's just, it's just at. Larry Brilliant. That's it. Oh. Let me see. Hold on. Let me make sure it's not something we're, we're screwed up about. At Larry B R I L L. There it is. M D P M P H, right? Okay. Oh, I'm okay. already following you. Interesting. <laughs> How about that? I can see I've made a big impact on you. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I get things scroll by. I'm, I'm following too many people. So Who knows? Maybe you guys are long-lost cousins. You know what? I did too. see this well, we are, one. We are long-lost cousins. I'm we sure. are indeed. That's actually true. You might be. You, you kind of look like Drew's uncle yes, a little bit. Yes, you're my cousin. Yes, you Weirdly do. Weirdly enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Uncle Jack. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed that right away. Yeah. With that, guys, let's close it out because I got to lie down. <laughs> I just I burn out thank really you. fast. Dr. Brilliant, thank you so much, and uh, we'll thank see everybody very much. tomorrow. Thank I believe we have uh, tomorrow's Tuesday. Do you know what we have tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow we are talking to Dr. Yadigar oh, Dr. about Yadigar. the cytokine yeah, he's, storm. Yeah, he runs an ICU. He's going to talk about his his protocols for uh, ICU practice and uh, response to the cytokine storm. He has and some on, news apparently, and he and has something going called, on. Yeah, and, and on we have... Wednesday we believe we're going to have Michaela Peterson in here to talk about uh, the uh, nastiness of the London Times, which I am want like to set that record straight. And then um, I also want to promote Hillsides, but we'll let Dr. Larry go before I do that. Dr. Larry, talk to you soon. Thank you. I hope so. Thank God you bless. so much. Okay, go ahead, Susan. You want to promote uh, the Hillsides event? That was great. You like that? Good. Oh, yeah. Good. Everybody loved it. Good. I had to boot somebody off of Twitch, though. He was what, like, what, what was he was about 12 years old. Everyone so was, was talking about him. I didn't see what he said. What did he say? Oh, exactly? he was just being mean and stupid. Mm. You know, like calling you old and stuff. No. I don't, I don't go for that. Okay, so I want to uh, talk about uh, an organization that we have near and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Hillsides. Uh, it's a premier provider dedicated to <coughs> healing children and young adults, strengthening families, and transforming communities through quality, comprehensive services and advocacy. We envision a world in which children and young adults, families, and communities are able to heal, grow, and thrive. Our values are quality, care, respect, integrity, transparency, compassion, collaboration, and innovations. 
And we, I was on the board of directors for seven years there. We have a big benefit coming up. And I got to tell you, it's usually so cool. Um, but this year it's all going to be virtual. And I got to find the banner. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Anyways, it's uh, called Raising Hope. It's on uh, Saturday, February 27th via live stream so everybody can come to my benefit i'm so excited and uh you can join or register at hillsides dot e join me slash raising hope 2021 and we'll have a virtual reception at 5 30 in the evening via live stream with fritz coleman as our mc and auctioneer uh, amazing things there and it's just a really fun group. They've already raised three hundred thousand dollars so far this year, which is pretty darn good. Uh, when I was on the board, um, I think we raised like six hundred overall. But to have raised that kind of money during a pandemic is amazing. Yeah. And um, yeah, get over there, sign up, and if you want to donate, you can. Um, we're fortunately last year we were able to. Um, have our our benefit right before the pandemic and we had a really really good turnout and it was a lot of fun this year we're all just going to be together virtually and hopefully some of our followers will will join us and and you know check out the goods they're pretty cool cool stuff over there so, and you know i don't know it just it's just a good thing to be a, be a part of it's a good organization and your money goes to the right place so and we help foster kids and yeah, it's a, it, homeless we've, we've kids. We've been working for this organization for years, uh, and they are the highest level of uh, educational living environment and therapeutics for kids that are come from horrible backgrounds, and uh, they have good outcomes. And then yeah. they have a transitional living environment in Pasadena for kids that are sort of on the cusp, keeping them from becoming homeless. And again, getting them engaged in the therapeutic process. Thank you, Casey Gates, for posting that we here. He just put up the link. Let me do Good. this. Thank you, Casey. I was just gonna do it, but he got he beat me to the punch. Okay. And you know how I when I start to sink, I gotta go fast. And so thank you everybody. Thank for you. We'll see you tomorrow and uh, Wednesday with uh, Michaela Peterson and uh, do sport uh, our friends at uh, at uh, Hillsides. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. I'm gonna play an ad. How about that? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> always bow up before I get to where I want to be. Oh, you want me to talk? Speaking some more? of nose, nose spray. Oh yeah. This pandemic began. We were not sure how it spread. Everyone began wearing masks and using hand sanitizers. Great ways to slow the spread, but a lot of people still get sick. I can personally attest to that. We now know that COVID-19 spreads via aerosols and droplets from the nose and mouth. And I've been thinking about this for a while. Why aren't we also sanitizing the nose and mouth, killing the virus directly at the place where it spreads? Why weren't more doctors thinking about this? Well, some doctors have done the research, which I discovered it sooner. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Halidine. It's an FDA-registered antiseptic for the nose and mouth that's proven to eliminate 99.99% .99 of the virus that causes COVID-19 in just 15 seconds. That's right. It's created by a team of clinicians with decades of experience in antiviral treatments, initially created to protect healthcare workers, these are smart scientists, and it's a great product that also eliminates many other viruses and infecting particles. I'm using both their nasal antiseptic swab and their oral spray to help protect those around me, and you should be too. For others and for yourself, whether you're hopping on a three-hour flight, always use it there, visiting grandparents or attending a meeting that you can't miss, Halodyne's family of oral and nasal antiseptics give you the safe, easy, on-the-go antiviral protection for up to four hours. I encourage you to try Halodyne at Halodyne.com today. My listeners get 10% off with the discount code Dr. Drew. That is H-A-L-O-D-I-N-E.com, discount code D-R-D-R-E-W. So obvious, it just makes sense. Stop the virus before it spreads and gets in your body with Halodyne. Well, I too have struggled with GI issues over the years. I have something called Lynch syndrome. So gut health is extremely important to me. And while gut health awareness has increased, it's led to a wellness trend that's inspired a host of questionable marketing and some false claims. Now you've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements, drinks, even more. They may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our gut needs for proper function, but all too often the promises are in fact too good to be true. Thankfully, I became aware of a company called Seed and their flagship product, the Daily Symbiotic. Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. These strains support gut health, 
and can improve regularity and relieve bloating, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's daily symbiotic apart is the delivery system. While some products may offer the right strains, they're fragile, they rarely survive the trip through the gut, doesn't get where it needs to go, but Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure the probiotic reaches your colon, which is where they often are needed. I have been taking Seed's Daily Symbiotic, and I really encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20 for 15% off your first month of Daily Symbiotic. That is S-E-E-D.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20. Real talk. Headlines have become it's sickening. They become poisonous. Dissecting headlines. Defying state orders. Sheriff Bianco not enforcing what the governor is saying. Dialed in with decision makers. Clarify what you actually meant. Get the answers you need. Beginning of this, we were told don't wear a mask. Is this really helping? Expect a different kind of newscast. Fox 11 News Special Report. Weeknights at 7 